What's up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Killer Chills. Today we are talking about the serial killer Richard Cottingham will be the subject of today's dissection, which probably, in retrospect, is not a good word to say. Good job introducing Whoops. us to you, by the way. Yeah, well, you know, I figured by now, um, that's true. Well, my name is Tim, and this is my friend Dev, and uh, I got kind of a, caught up there with the dissection um analogy which in retrospect i probably should have thought about that one but we're gonna go with it today today yeah today's gonna be <laughs> a real doozy for sure it's it's gross it's this one's you, gross just, <laughs> the last one was gross and it was also a doozy <laughs> and the which one i before think that was also a doozy. No, exactly. the last one was a mega doozy. The, this one, I would say... Slightly is... less of a mega doozy, but more than a doozy. Yeah, researching this guy actually left me queasy a little bit, which it takes a lot for me to get a little queasy, and that that definitely happened. So, yeah. at least looking at the crime scene photos of this killer. So, that one really... I'm surprised that there's even photos of of that circulating... There but. shouldn't be because they're they're bad. They're bad. We were talking about it before we started recording. We we're like, we're gonna be hard pressed to find photos right. that we can actually use. So I'm gonna do my best throughout this episode to kind of show what I can and um, see where that leads us. But um, yeah, it's it's definitely. I mean, you can just Google the guy's name, hit images, and they're there. <laughs> yeah. So. Wouldn't recommend it, but you can. Um, again, as always, your discretion is advised. Uh, yes. Be careful where you watch this. Yes, this is this one will contain a lot of, you know, descriptions of uh, very violent stuff. So, viewer discretion is advised extremely for this one. Yeah. So um, I guess we'll uh, jump into it now. As Tim said, today we're talking about Richard Francis Cottingham born November 25th of 1946, and he was born in Mott Haven, Bronx, New York, and he was the first of four children. Um, I think they had two... I saw there... It was, it was one daughter and then two two other brothers, so there's three... I read... Oh, okay. I read he had all sisters. I read... <laughs> 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 well, I read. I think, yeah. I, regardless, he had he had, he had was four siblings, four, or three siblings, three siblings. And um, I would say, you know, I did the. You know what? I don't even know if that's actually been confirmed a lot. There's not a lot known about his. Well, I don't know if I would want to be lumped into his past either. Right. I didn't find. I didn't too even much. find his parents' names. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't find a lot on the guy's actual upbringing. Well, but I know you—you you typically take reins on the upbringing part. Yeah, and I mean, I found quite a bit, but this one's weird because typically most serial killers grow up with a bunch of violence from a very young age. Right. Richard didn't really. Um. So when he was about two years old, so 1948, his family mo moved to Dumont, New Jersey. So this is when he started living in New Jersey. And at that time when he's like kind of growing up, um, he was known in the neighborhood as a very like shy, quiet kid, but he was also seen out like feeding the animals um, because where huh. he lived, there's a lot of like forested property. So he'd be out there like feeding the deers. And I think he actually like raised I think it, they said it was like a. There are pigeons of some sort, like carrier pigeons. Um, Pheasants. Yeah, it was. I think it was carrier pigeons, but he raised some type of bird, mm. and um, everybody just knew him as like the quiet, sweet little neighborhood kid, and he was always kind of shy, and that's even something that followed him into adulthood. Um, even when he was at work, he was always very shy. But everybody was just like, yeah, he's just normal. Just Richard. Kind yeah. Of, yeah. He was just like Which a relatively is... normal kid. Um, there wasn't really too much to it at all. But once he, uh, 
he moved again in 1956. And that's around when he uh, started going to high school. Um, he moved to another spot in New Jersey. But when he went to high school, that's when his uh, sexual urges started coming out and really becoming prompt. And oh, a lot no. of people were kind of uh, turned off by that, rightfully this, so. This man lost it during puberty. Yeah, um, there was something, too, that I saw that he had a head injury at some point. Oh, no. Okay. Um, I think it was towards, I want to say it was the frontal lobe. The spot where you get hit in the head and it's easy to mess something up. Yeah. Um, But there wasn't really any confirmation that that had anything to do with the way that he was or not. Um, And again... From what I saw, that's just another theory, I guess. Right. Because um, he convinces he can commits his first murder, I believe, when he was twenty one. Yeah. So it was after he graduated high school. Yeah. So um, in nineteen sixty four, he graduated from um, Pasig Valley High School, and at that time. After high school, he started working at his dad's um, firm, and it was for Metropolitan Life. Yeah, big and um, his dad was company. the yeah his dad was the vice president of it. So that's kind of how he actually ended up getting his job there. That's some money right there. That's that's a huge position, and Metropolitan Life is a huge, huge company in New York and everywhere, honestly. So if he was the vice president. His dad was the vice president, that's, not Richard. That's um, some serious money right there. What, was it? So I'm assuming that he was well, like grew up wealthy then. Um, yeah, I would I would say so. Um, for back then, yeah. Um, he yeah, was definitely especially back then growing up wealthy, and he started out just in the mail room there, and then he worked his way up to the mainframe operator, um, or the mainframe computer operator, which back then that was a pretty like decent gig to have like yeah being like fresh out of high school and so dad daddy helped him oh essentially yeah get to where he was so i don't think he went to college everything i read just no i didn't see didn't go to college college at all um because i mean like he had a pretty solid job doing that and because he had that job he later started working for a big big insurance company which is still around today which personally is the insurance i have too blue cross blue shield yep yeah started working for there and he worked (laughs) worked there until his arrest in a 1980 wow so he's not you know he's not your typical like you know car mechanic or you know typical thing that i read serial killers being yeah and even like um again too when he was at working at blue cross blue shield Everybody there just knew him as, like, the quiet guy that yep. was a hard worker, just went, did his job, went home. And eventually he actually got so good at doing his job that they just let him make his own schedule and just kind of show up when he wanted to. And that was actually develops into a big problem later. He stays quiet, but I know towards the end, um, leading up to his arrest, um, he does start to open his mouth a little bit. And that's when red flags start flying. Yes. And the thing about this, too, is what everybody said, and even back in his high school days when um, one of his classmates and uh, track teammates um, said that Richard was very, like, arrogant. The thing that makes me think of the way that Richard was is, you know, and it's always sunny in Philadelphia when Dennis, like, goes to the high school reunion. He's like, I am a golden god. (laughs) That's yeah. kind of like how um, Richard was because he didn't, like, fall into anybody's clique. He didn't have a nickname. Right. He was very um, just arrogant and kind of full of himself and wanted to be a leader, but nobody really kind of right. followed him. So that's why I'm like that comparison between Dennis and him um, are just so, like, hand in hand. Right. And the one thing we actually – we do have an individual here who did not – go to the military or was not in the military yep that was where i was actually going to say to you so so far <laughs> every other serial killer that we had talked about 
granted this is what episode four <laughs> yeah but still but it's just like most a... serial killers have some type of tie into the military right and richard did not so no um yeah he just kind of went to high school got out of high school daddy got him a job and he basically stays doing that for the rest of his life yeah um and once he started to go work for Blue Cross Blue Shield, because he had that mainframe computer operator job, he pretty much did the same thing at Blue Cross Blue Shield. Because back then, computers aren't how they are now. They had to have somebody that like kind of manually like set things up and did this and that. Right. Because computers then weren't like what we have behind us or like a small laptop. No, it's they were like huge. an entire like building basically one that you of had his, to go and do stuff yeah one of his co-workers said the um entire computer took up an entire floor yeah of the building just to push and i think it was like 500 milligram of uh, um 500 was it megabytes yeah it wasn't a lot it was a gig didn't even exist back then yeah there was no such thing as gigabytes terabytes yeah. anything like that back then which is why the job that he had because it was so complicated once he found a company that needed somebody with that experience, they're like, get him in. Yeah. Like, we need him. And that's what he did. And shortly after working at Blue Cross Blue Shield, he gets married. Um, May of 1970, I believe. May 30th of 1970 yep. to his wife, um, Janet. And they had three kids. Um, we'll kind of touch on this later, but just briefly go over it. In 1978, janet divorced him because he was going out a lot yep and she stated for mental, obvious reasons she stated abandonment and mental, mental cruelty. cruelty and what that kind of came down to was because richard after they had their third child refused to have sex with her right um he just wasn't about it and he stated it's because she didn't want to help him live out these twisted, dark, messed up fantasies. Right. I think, yeah, it started to bleed into his married life, um, some of his impulses and urges. But, um, and that, you know, she uh, ended up putting it, signing a petition for divorce. Um, it actually didn't get finalized until after his arrest and after everything. But... One thing I found weird is they were married in the 70s, right? In 1970, right? Yeah. May. This guy ends up on multiple occasions having instances where he gets arrested. Um, once being in August of 1972, uh, he's shoplifting. He gets a $50 fine. Then in September of 73, this is where the first red flag should have actually come out of and. This is where it just should have been, which is actually during his marriage. Yeah. And he gets arrested for robbery and um, oral. Put the link up there. I can't. I don't know if I can say that word. <laughs> oral sodomy <laughs> and sexual abuse towards a prostitute. Yeah. And the case ended up being dismissed. Neither party wanted to, I don't, I think she didn't want to pursue, you know, that's what unfortunately was the case. If, you know, a lot of prostitutes couldn't afford a lawyer, they couldn't afford proper representation in any way. So a lot of them just decided to say, well, whatever. And the big thing too, with back then, anybody who was a sex worker, um, they were kind of, treated like they were less than everybody else yeah very so unfortunate the police whenever we'll see this with a lot a lot of other serial killers in the future that we'll talk about um the police just never really cared that yeah, much because the they were sex were workers just kind of thrown out yeah you know? because they either one just didn't believe them or two just didn't care and yeah, and this happens again, actually, a year later in 74, he's arrested again for the exact same thing, but this time they charge him with false imprisonment. Mm -hmm. So I don't know the details of what was going on, but these are both in 1973 and 1974 while he's married. Like, what is his wife thinking? Like, I know I'm married. You have a girlfriend. If, if you know, if, you know... They heard that one of us was, you know, arrested for robbery, false imprisonment of a prostitute. 
and you know oral sodomy what no why did she didn't why didn't she want to divorce him right then and there so the thing was because he was abusive in the relationship uh, the control this factor. is uh, the control factor but also this is something that's super common and i know i've been saying that a lot but all these serial killers they all fall under the same commonality but when somebody is in an abusive relationship it's always really hard for them to leave because psychologically sometimes they think that they can change that person yeah and make things better and save that relationship and sometimes they are just genuinely scared to leave because they don't know what will happen but the thing is too his wife even throughout the trial trial after the divorce she was still like no he's innocent like she believed that he did not do that for her I mean, ever and I think if my husband got arrested twice in two years for robbery and sex crimes, I I'd be pretty sure I'd be like, well, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, sorry, honey, your track time, record isn't good. Yeah, <laughs> after the first time, you, you should probably just be like, I right, I'm a bounce. Like, yeah, I, yeah. After the first, I'd be like, nope, absolutely but it, not. But again, too, like I get kind of understand where she's coming from because these people are so manipulative, right? And do you kind of roll with an iron fist? Like they're unforgiving people. They or he they portrayed, have control, or he portrayed a completely different version of himself, and he was just loving and kind, and he it, was he, to his kids, but to her, like he was, he was just abusive. The abusive. Yeah. Well, yeah, mental cruelty. Yeah, and then towards the end, I I believe like it was like he he was just never home, like he yeah. was just never home. Um, so probably didn't help out around the house or did anything. He he just stayed out, and we you know later on here we're we're gonna find out what he was doing. Um, but yeah, his first murder um doesn't occur I believe until actually. It was in October of 1967, and this one actually got proven later on, I believe in 2010, was mm-hmm. when he confessed to it, um, Nancy Vogel. And uh, she was found strangled in her car in the back seat, nude, and with her hands bound. Um, and that was the first one that kind of led. Um, but obviously they didn't associate that murder with him not until 2010 so they didn't know that's you're going to kind of see that that was kind of a that's going to be a theme here is that there's a lot of these unsolved cases unsolved murders that happen in the new jersey and new york area that don't get you know he as time goes on and uh he kind of starts confessing to them later on in life and i'm sure you're probably going to touch on it too i think it's actually is one of the next ones in 1968 they just from three weeks from about today, yes. he had just gotten charged with another one. Yes. And I'll let you get to that, Di- but I know it's Diane, coming up. Diane Kru- Krusik? Krusiak? Oh, so it is the next one. It is the next one, yeah. Uh, that On the timeline, yes. And he was actually linked to that recently, um, back in June, so last month, um, via DNA evidence. And it's actually yeah. the oldest case to be solved with dna yes so um i believe yeah i had just found out about this one this past sunday Um, yeah you told me and we're like hey we're doing richard cottingham for our next one and like and then this happens or like you found we found that out and i was like whoa okay I, i showed you and then okay honestly find the footage from the court hearing online because it's just so like pathetic yeah you're just kind of like dude like well the why man is he is... getting the luxury of like all of this because the meeting was in or the court hearing i guess is in skype or zoom right because he's hospitalized yeah he has for, the, the i don't know what the, i don't know he's just old as hell who gives a shit dying of being evil yeah like i don't know he's a serial killer who yeah. cares but He's in the hospital bed, and it looks like he's falling asleep. Right. And I think the beautiful thing about this was if he does get better from this, in just three years, I'm pretty sure he was eligible for p- 
parole somehow. So in 2025, he would have been eligible for parole. And then he got charged with this just less than a month ago. And now he's for sure dying in prison. Yeah, call it karma, God, the universe. Something was like, no. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's so sad because her daughter, who at the time when um when Diane was killed, was only four. And right. she was just leaving from teaching a dance class. And then Richard, being Richard, just went and killed her. And she finally got some type of justice. Obviously, yep. it's never going to bring back that what like 50 plus years of not of not time. having a mom you know yeah but you know we'll we'll see kind of parallels too with him and uh the golden state killer that just recently got um, apprehended not too long ago a few years ago i believe mm-hmm. but yeah that one was linked to him and he he basically was just uh he's gonna do this again where um or you're going to hear of a few more cases that get brought up a little bit later that turn into full-blown confessions. Yeah. Um, for instance, the next one, um, Jacqueline Harp. Um, she was killed on July 17th of 1968, and she was also strangled um, with the cor- with the leather strap of her bag. Mm-hmm. She was uh, a teenager, I believe, walking home and this was in new jersey and she was just walking walking home i believe from band practice is what it said her high school band practice yeah so he just found her on the um on walking home on the side of the street and decided that he would go ahead and and do this so he was you're also going to see that his mo changes um he always ends up committing the crime um in the same manner but you're going to see that his MO and his methodology of how he finds his victims and where he commits the crimes are always different. Yeah, he was never consistent with it, and that was something that kind of... He, he wasn't consistent with it till later. Till later. Till it, later on, he gets consistent by revisiting the same location yeah. three times. But he never did that prior up to this, but... And it wasn't until the then. the mutilation to the bodies, yeah, they, which we're going to They started getting... Into. A little bit more intense yeah because around this time he's it's starting to get out there that there's a serial killer within the general vicinity right at this time he's known as the times square killer yep that is and he lives once it gets into it we'll we'll tell you his new nickname <laughs> yeah well yeah <laughs> so he gets well you're talking about the the Taurus okay Yep. The yep. Torso killer. Torso killer. Only because I, it is probably going to be on the thumbnail. <laughs> it, it is. Yeah. I don't know why we try to pretend like people are aren't get, like we're going to keep it a secret. Yeah, <laughs> when it's like right here. I uh, know. I mean, I do know some. Most people actually don't know too much about him. Mm-hmm. But as I was reading about him and and uh, what I've known in the past, he's he was probably. The closest thing uh, America has seen um, since, like, H.H. H. Holmes or some of the earlier ones in terms of his brutality um, to Jack the Ripper. Yeah. Um, a lot of his motives that he's going to say there was a witness, the last, in fact, the victim that ends up getting him arrested um, is the one that ends up stating in her um, in interview with police that he he stated that... Um, he wanted her to shut up and that she's deserving of what she's having done to her. She was a sex worker and that because of that, she needs to be punished. And that is a reoccurring theme here, which is, was also, you know, a reoccurring theme supposedly with Jack the Ripper. So there were many correlations with that. And Mm -hmm. I think that's, um, that's a good, uh, segue. It is. And I want to mention to you real quick, He's not Jack the Ripper. He's not. Absolutely this not. This is way later. <laughs> yeah. I'm tired of seeing those oh, arguments like, online. Oh my gosh, he's Jack the Ripper. And like, no, that was 1888. <sighs> this is 1970. This man. <laughs> but you know, there, there's people out there like, he's Jack the Ripper. He's not. No. He's he not, was though. born in 1946. So no. Yeah. No. There's no, no way. But and he's still people. alive 
today somehow. So right. it's for sure not Jack the Ripper. Stop <laughs> saying that. Yeah, anytime. Yeah, there are probably people out it's there so that ridiculous. would be, find some kind of conspiracy to link him to that. Like he was, he was Jack the Ripper's son, or like he's continuing on his legacy. And I'm like, ah, oh, that's all a bunch of crap. Yeah, I know that's <laughs> a load of baloney, if you ask me. So on April seventh of nineteen sixty nine, to close out, I guess the sixties, he commits another murder, um, the murder of Irene um, Blaze. Um, she was also strangled, and she was actually found in Saddle River, which I believe is out of Hackensack, New Jersey, and she was found face down with her hound, hands bound, um, ligature marks around the neck. Um, but they all they say the main cause of death was actually drowning. Really? So he, um, yes, he abducted her, and then I believe either drowned her there in the river, um, and then that's he just left her there, and that's where they found her body, which is kind of goes back to what I was saying by he. Wait, was she the one that um, they found like water in her lungs? Yes. Okay. Um, and I believe he goes back to drowning um, later on, too. But this one, yeah, they found her um, riverside uh, on the Saddle River there in New Jersey. So that um, kind of closed out the 60s for him. And then he continues going on. He continues doing this. And then this, as when the 70s come around, he, that's when he really starts to migrate a little bit more out of New Jersey, local New Jersey. And he starts committing crimes um in the new york area like Mm -hmm. the like um manhattan yeah but not before he commits one more on july 14th of 1969 um saddlebrook new jersey again he um murdered denise uh falaska and she was found on a road next to a cemetery also strangled Mm -hmm. so we're kind of seeing a pattern here where you know his his main mo um is strangulation but he ends up leaving committing the crimes and leaving bodies you know started out in cars mm-hmm. then started to get pub- more public places side of a road a river he started to get like more comfortable and yes i think a big thing too that we should mention as opposed to um a couple of weeks ago when we had talked about dennis nelson um with richard he didn't strangle victims because it kept the bodies pristine. He didn't care about that right. at all. He That was just the easiest way he found to kill the victims. Right. And I, I think there was an element of, you know, sexual gratification. Yeah. That happened out of strangulation. Um, and as you see with the two, the probably his most famous um, cases, the, the hotel in Manhattan that he set fire to. Mm-hmm. We'll get to those later, but he definitely does not care about leaving the bodies in a pristine um, condition. Yeah, um, not at all. And again, too, like how you were saying with the strangulation, I think that makes sense because he was really into like the sadomastica- sado- sadomasochism. Yeah. And definitely sadist. Uh, you know, a lot of, sometimes you see serial killers who are masochists. He, he, and by far, honestly... Richard Cottingham is probably one of the most sadistic killers Mm -hmm. that I see. Just pure, you know, he, you know, some more often than not, it's always sexual related, but Richard Cottingham, I think, took it to a whole new level. Yeah. He really got gratification from inflicting pain and Mm -hmm. from torturing um, his victims. And that, that's something that you, I think just kept building and building and building. Um, In his early years, it's almost like he kind of, had the same idea that um, Gary Ridgway had, the yeah. Green River Killer, where he would pick up a, a, a prostitute and then take them somewhere secluded, and which could be why some of his early victims were found in cars, in the backseat of cars. So I, I think that, that that's a pretty big uh, red flag as to what was going on in his early years. But he continues on, and in 1974, he murders uh, Marie uh, Kelly, and also at the same time, on um, the same night, um, in on August 9th, 74, he also murders Mary Ann Pryor. So it was like um, 
also kind of reminiscent to Jack the Ripper where he does mm-hmm. two in one one day, which is just crazy. Um, but that was also, that was, I believe, one of his last ones in New Jersey, apart from the Quality Inn fiasco. Um, yeah. But she was found also drowned and did not say if it was in a river or a hotel or a, I couldn't find where where they were found. Um, but they were both drowned and, you know, raped, sexually assaulted, and those were both attributed to him. And it wasn't until after that um, that they attributed... I read um, that he has five more murders between 1977 and 1980 that they didn't list the names. Yeah, I think those are still the cold case ones. Um, I know there's a couple that he got charged for, but there's a lot of cold case ones because when he had a interview back in 2013 to 2014 ish, this is when he was still like talking and coherent. Right. I mean, they had ultimately asked him like, how many people did you kill? And he's like, I can't say that. And then they're like, okay, like ballpark here. Like yeah. he's like less than a hundred, more than 80. Yeah. He, he stated like, some ridiculous number. As they always kind of do. And he said, like, he was averaging out, like, killing at least one person, like, every couple of weeks. But, again, a lot of those haven't been proven yet. Right. So, is it kind of him trying to, like, brag, or is it factual? We don't really know. I think what's scary about him is I did not get bragging vibes from him. He yeah. kind of owned that he was evil. He owned what he had done. And I think one of the most terrifying things about him specifically is that is that reason. Is that he didn't... I don't think he really cared about fame. He had no family that he was really worried, um, worried about or, you know, caring about. I mean, he said that he loved his kids, but it's, I, I, I don't think he cared. Right. So in December of 1977, this is where um, he first commits a crime at one of the locations that's going to kind of become infamous with his his case. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the Quality Inn um, in Hash, is it Hashbrook Heights, Hash, Hashbrook Heights, New Jersey. I know um, it's not Hawthorne Heights. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not Hawthorne Heights. But... Um, this is where he commits the murder of Marianne Carr. And she, I believe, was the x-ray technician mm-hmm. that went missing. Um, and then was eventually found uh, strangled and handcuffed in the parking lot of the Quality Inn. And this is the case that pretty much really shook the New Jersey area. She was mm-hmm. a resident of... Um, little fairy the little fairy apartments which is actually where he lived with his at the time and i think too an important thing to mention here is around this time is when i had mentioned earlier that his work was starting to let him make his own schedules right this was around the time when he started to take his co-workers keys and go and make copies of them oh that's good he never went after any of his co-workers but had he had not been caught, who knows the damage that could have been done. Right. Because on his lunch break, his lunch break, he would go and just make copies of the keys and go and put it back like nothing had ever happened. Right. Because when he got captured, too, he just had like one of those janitor like rings of keys. Yep. All of his copies. And I mean, like, I know like... My keys are in the door, and I would have shown them, but remember how we had that competition here? Who had the most keys on a key ring? Yeah. And we all had, like, 13, 14 different keys. He had, like, 20, 30, 40, like, Yeah, that's so that's many. That's terrifying, you know? And he probably researched, like, what women they had, his coworkers had in, in their families. I mean, keep in mind, too, he's the one running all the computers and stuff for Blue Cross oh, Blue Shield. That's terrifying. So it's like he had easy access to everything because of the position he was in. Yeah. But, you know, it's for the Marianne Carr, um, she, like I said, she lived in Little Ferry, the Little Ferry Apartments in New Jersey, um, where he lived with his wife and kids. And he um, probably saw her, another resident, and decided to abduct her and then 
I don't because I don't even believe she was a prostitute. I think she was just a resident mm-hmm. that he saw. But the next the next set of of murders that happens is probably um, the most famous. Like I had said a little bit earlier, that is the what he's going to be known for, um, the torso killer as well as the Times Square killer. This is when he moves and kind of shifts a bit of his, the locale of where he commits crimes. Mm -hmm. So this case in December of 1979, the police get a a call about a fire, um, in the travel in motel, which is in, you know, midtown Manhattan. They get a call. Um, there's a fire in a room. So, you know, they go, go up to the floor. I think it was on, I think it was like the, I think it was like a second or third. Yeah, it, it, I, don't, you, I know it wasn't the first floor. Um, so they go up there and they barge in and they put out the fire that actually wasn't that big. Mm-hmm. It wasn't it wasn't like a blaze or a raging inferno. They, they got it because, you know, Richard really didn't do a good job, as you'll see. Uh, he's not very the best. He's not very good at lighting fires, even though he tries. So in, they put they put out the fire, and then they realize that on the bed are two two victims. Um, and the thing about these victims is one of them, both of them, um, have their heads removed. As I was well. about to say too, because I, I know that when the firefighters went in there, he saw one of the bodies and like grabbed it and like rushed out. Oh, and he took off his yeah. gear and tried to give it mouth to mouth, and then he realized. like just like went down for it. Because they were burned pretty bad at this point, right. like the bodies were, and he was like, "Oh, like there's still movement, da 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 da." Which there might have been, but I mean, mm-hmm. I d- yeah, I don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's he just took impulse. off, um, like the like the the mask and the helmet and everything. He went to go and give it mouth to mouth, and he like went down and just started screaming. Because there was no head. Right. Yeah, that's, um, that would be terrifying. And I, I think it was probably impulse. Like, he saw, like, a human figure on the bed, and, like, his first thought was just grab it and, grab it and I mean, try to like, get out. That's their job. That's what they're trained yeah, to do. And Dead, I, alive, doesn't yeah. matter. You're just trained to grab them and run. Right. And I, I don't think he realized the situation. Um, but anyways, these, these two victims, both heads were removed as well as their hands. Um, they don't have any idea. You know, at first they thought it was gang related. Um, and, you know, it, it could have been a case of, um, you know, someone double, someone crossed the wrong gang and their family was targeted. And these are the two wives of, or children of someone. They thought, it, you know, typically, you know, this is in the 70s, uh, 70s. So. So that's when like. The mob was big. Yeah. There was a lot of crime. There's and a lot of division between communities. Yes. And that's when like gangs really started to kind of get big, especially in that area. Yep. And and they, they it wasn't until they, you know, began the autopsies and kind of they found the um, identity of only one of the victims. Mm-hmm. And that was De- Deborah Gar- Gardiazzi. I'm probably not saying that right, but... Deborah is the one that has been identified and she had been missing for a, a while. Um, mm-hmm. I think it was a few weeks to a month. Cause uh, she was a runaway. Wasn't runaway. She? And she was working as a prostitute there in the Times Square red light district. So, you know, they are able to identify her, but they're not able to identify the other one to this day. Uh, they they haven't been able to identify her. And, um, with the first one too, I think the only reason why they were able to identify her is because her body wasn't nearly as burned as the other one, right? Right. I believe so. Um, I think she might have been the one that that firefighter tried to give mouth right. to mouth and to. And that there is a photo of, I think. Um, it's not. I don't recommend. Going yeah, to there, look it up. there it's, are there it's are gonna photos ruin your day. of of these two. Uh, I believe it actually might only be the one. Um, and you know, I'm not going to post them here. You can look at them at your own discretion. They are very, very graphic. Um, so, but you can find them online. It will ruin your day. Yeah, it, it will ruin your day. Um, so, 
they basically they have no idea who could have committed this and uh, or you know oh and you know he set fire and what he did to set the fire is he actually set the fire underneath the bed mm-hmm. which i i don't know why he thought that was a good idea cuz actually that that would be a lot harder for it to really in golf i think he thought that the whole floor might catch on fire i i always thought like this is just my opinion is i guess it would kind of make sense because if you lie underneath the mattress the mattress is going to be kind of like the first thing to catch to call, fire yeah i understand what and then that burns and i think he thought it was going to be like a crematory like it was going to yeah i i well, don't know but that just seems like it would make sense i you guess know, in his trial and when he confesses to these these murders that's when he says the only reason for the dismemberment of the head and hands is so that they were going to be unable to be identified. Mm-hmm. Now this is a first, this is a new thing that he has never done before. Yeah. So he's clearly trying to shift his MO and change it up and really kind of hopefully thinking maybe that he's been doing this for a while now at this point, almost 10, 15 years, he has to change something. And then he's also probably realizing that he is committing a crime in the middle of Manhattan which is, you know, it's not like it's out in the suburbs. It's not like it's, you know, it's dead set in the city. Um, so, you know, he knows that the NYPD are going to be on. They're a little bit more trained. They're a little bit more resilient. Um, they have more resources uh, for them to kind of link him to it. So I think that's why he took that extra precaution. But the the missing limbs were never found. He never said what he did with them. Um, but that would lead... You know, they wouldn't find and link this until he confessed to them Yeah, that they wouldn't, they didn't link, um, these, these murders to him. He ended up confessing to it when he was already convicted, but, um, that's what he was pretty, that nicknamed him the, the Times Square killer, um, because he'll do this again at a, at another hotel. Um, he'll do the same MO to another victim, mm-hmm. which in my, in my case would actually be a little bit more, well, equally as graphic um but this leads to his next murder which sees him revisiting the quality inn motel in new jersey which is kind of out in the suburbs a little bit yeah and what he would do is he would go pick up prostitutes that were working in manhattan in new york and then he would drive them all the way across state line which to his advantage would have seen because then you know the NYPD would be the one on it and they have to, that would be crossing jurisdiction. Yeah. It makes it a lot more complicated. Um, so he probably thought that that's why, you know, he, he thought he was probably using that to his advantage. Um, but her name was Valerie street and she was strangled. Um, there were marks on her body, biting marks, bite marks. Um, he started getting a little bit more savage and this is the one case that they were able to she was murdered in in a room at the quality Inn motel so she wasn't on the street but um this is the one case where um he did actually leave a fingerprint yeah and this would be his unraveling the yeah. start of it and um i think a big thing to mention here is how we brought up sadomasochism earlier there's a huge difference between that and BDSM. Oh, absolutely. Um, I think that's a really important thing to mention because a lot of people do kind of get their wires crossed with it. Oh, it's the same thing. It's like, absolutely no, not. it's not. No, this is... And this is around the time, too, that he's getting really cocky and arrogant yep. about his killings. Like, he's going to his work. He's talking about, like, all this stuff that, like, he would do. And um, he started going to, yep. like, those... Uh, BDSM clubs and he had talked about how um he went there and he saw uh, a woman with a guy on a leash that was uh she was whipping him and I guess he'd followed them into the bathroom she made him like lick the urinal and that was something that like he got off on right and he really enjoyed that and this is around the time, too, that his marriage starts to kind of fall apart because he wants to start living out these fantasies. And again, how we were saying earlier that he's starting to be gone all the time. 
it's around this time period when that starts to get more and more prominent. So right, they're getting more intense too. Um, you know, he starts he gets in, aggressive. Uh, he starts getting really aggressive. Very, you know, he starts mutilating the bodies. Um, there was evidence. Uh, I should have actually mentioned this prior, but there was evidence that those two uh, murders in Manhattan that he set fire to. There was evidence on their bodies of prolonged torture Mm -hmm. and i believe authorities said that they both both of these victims were kept in that hotel room for over a week being just tortured like he just kept them there tied up and you know they had whip marks on their backs and you know ligature marks everywhere so there's yeah evidence that they were being tortured for a while and probably you know starved and which that's changes from his previous methodology and he just gets way more violent. It's almost as, as time goes on, his, his violence level just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. And, you know, then you would see, um, in 1980, uh, May 15th, you'll see, um, that he murders, um, Gene Rayner, I believe at the Seville hotel, which is a high rise hotel. Well, it's not, it's like 12 stories, so not high rise compared to New York, but um, she's found in a room that has also been set on fire and she has been mutilated. He left, um, he excised the breast area mm-hmm. and left them on a mantle in the hotel room and um, and the body was not actually on the bed when they found it. He had just tried to set fire to the room to cover his tracks. Um, but that was how they were able to link, okay, well, the perpetrator of this murder must have done the murders at the, the Travel Inn Motel in Manhattan. Because it's the same MO. MO so yes. they're starting to connect the dots here. Yep, like dis- dis- dismemberment of some kind happened. He set the room on fire. This has to be the same person. So then they're starting to basically catch on. And it wasn't until that same month in May of 1980 when he, this is the final one that, that dragged him down. Um, he attempts to murder uh, Leslie Odell, Leslie mm-hmm. Odell. And it, the same kind of thing with, um, I guess you could say previous like Israel Keys and Dennis Nielsen. He gets, he gets cocky. And he gets overconfident. And what he does is he takes her back again to the Quality Inn Motel in New Jersey, the same one where he's committed two previous murders. And at this point, too, the police are starting to keep yep. an eye on it, too. Yep. Even the hotel staff. Now I had two murders, one in the parking lot, one in a room. They're the on edge. He was there yeah. around all those times. Yep. And so the staff, and I, you know, they, I remember reading somewhere that they um they interviewed the staff and they they were all on edge you know everyone that worked there like two murders had happened here you know it was probably like a i could be one of those things like working there it's like you don't want to work there Mm -hmm. but anyway he brings he brings leslie back into her room he begins to torture her ties her up and you know basically this is where he makes the comment um that you're you you're getting what you deserve you're you're a or you deserve to be punished. And that's what she would later recant to investigators. Um, But she started just screaming, Mm -hmm. just like banshee crying, yelling as loud as she could. And he was trying to keep her quiet. He was trying to give her um, like Like sleeping pills, everything he could, because he he would have sleeping pills on him, diazepam. And now, um, correct me if I'm wrong here, I think this is the same one I'm thinking about, but because so, like, did, I'm pretty sure because she was screaming so much, I think somebody had complained about it and alerted the staff, Yes. and then the staff called the police, yep. the police go up to the room, and at this time, she's, um, has been tortured quite a bit, I'm pretty sure he was like, carving in her skin yeah. and stuff he was about and he was about ready to kill her and um the police had knocked on the door right and then he goes and answers and they're like where's the girl like kind of asking him. they're not like pressing really hard but they're like hey 
got complaints, just came to check. Yep. And then she goes to the door and he's like, tell them everything is fine or I'll kill you. And I think he pressed like a gun or a knife in her back. And then um, she was like, yeah, I'm fine. Everything's okay. But she was like looking back like really hard with her eyes. And they were like, oh, okay, see you later. And then she just fell down sobbing because she thought they were like, just gonna leave yeah and then like what like 10 seconds later they like like bang on the door they're like please open up now we're busting down the door they they didn't give him a choice and um eventually they would lead him out they found everything as Mm -hmm. they entered you know it's his hotel room and he was arrested right there in the hallway um leslie was thankfully saved um, and she would, her testimony would basically just put the nail in his coffin. Um, because obviously he got, basically he got caught red handed yeah. just before he was about to murder her. Um, so, you know, they were able to eventually then match his fingerprint to the fingerprint found. Um, I believe was it, it was, uh, was it Marianne Carr, her at her crime scene? Mm-hmm. Um, they were able to match that so okay we have we can charge you with this 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 and then once he's in custody he starts to open up a little bit more over time he's tried for several of these killings sent to jail and that's when i believe he got 172 life sentences i believe or years it might have been all of those together but um he basically gets into that and we're uh we're at where we are here where he's in jail and he's basically still been confessing to murders that you know thankfully we have record of now but at the time like at this time back in like even 2005 we didn't he only had about like what like three or three four or five victims i think he only had like three or four And then that just kept, like, adding on to his sentences. Right. Because just for those ones, I think they gave him, like, basically what I would say is, like, a slap on the wrist sentence for all the stuff that he did. Because I know, like, somehow in 2025 he was going to be eligible for parole, but I don't know if they, like, did that kind of, like, as a middle finger because they knew he was going to die before then. Right. But... Again, like the one we were saying that just happened three weeks ago, he's for sure going to die in prison now because they're right. just kind of like they charged him with that one. Um, I don't DNA know. DNA doesn't lie. Yeah, I don't know exactly he... like what his sentence was, but it was. It was. It was pretty it intense. Was, yeah, it was regardless. Aggressive. And then uh, when they searched his home in Lodi, New Jersey, which if you look on a map, I can put it up here. Uh, you can kind of see that all the the killings in New Jersey are all kind of in the same radius um this is the house that he moved to after the little fairy apartments uh when his family finally moved out of that apartment living and moved into a home he the police would find that he had a locked room in the basement that they found all personal effects to most all of the and that that was a big oh man like this this man has done this and has been doing this for years um so, and there's actually a weird little fact here is that when he was working at Blue Cross Blue Shield, I believe, he worked in the same on the same floor in as uh the dating game killer, uh mm-hmm. Richard Alcala. And that to our knowledge and what everything I read, they didn't know of each other's existence. Um but that that's just kind of crazy. Yeah, cuz th- these were both kind of happening around Right. Roughly around the same time. Yeah. And I think, like, granted, their killings were in slightly different areas. Yeah. But I think they were kind of starting to, like, get which killer confused with who. Right. <laughs> but we're actually going to talk about him at yeah, some we'll, point. We'll, so we'll talk about him at a different we'll date. We'll just leave it at that. Um, but, uh, yeah, I would say right now Richard Cottingham is, for uh, at this time, in a hospital bed. And I believe he could uh, go at any time, which to what I would say, good riddance and should have happened a long time ago. Yeah, he's I think he's 75 now. Yep. And there are plenty of interviews that you can watch with him. And the man is just 
clearly not sorry, almost takes pride in what he did. Um, he's not remorseful in, in the slightest. He just basically mm-hmm. said, you know, he. I remember watching one where he's like, well, you know, there's got to be something wrong with me. And there probably is. And, you know, he just goes on to say uh, how, like, he knows what he did wasn't normal, but he just did it anyways. And, you know, he does look like Santa Claus now. So... Yeah, he kind of looks like an evil Santa. Like he is the evil not Santa. monstery like Krampus, but like it looks like an evil Santa. But it's messed up because I know exactly which interview you're talking about. Because they're like, "Are you sorry?" And he's like, "Well, is anybody ever sorry?" Yeah, me saying sorry to the victims' families isn't going to bring him back. So why does it matter? Why should I say it? He's yeah. like. I guess I'm sorry. It's like he's not sorry for what he did. He's sorry that he got caught and he got in trouble. Right. And on his, you know, these were, these were just, you know, these these were teenage girls that that was pretty much his age range, right? So he was robbing. You know, it was it was either teenagers that were not prostitutes or prostitutes still within that age range. But I think uh, I think Deborah uh, Gardazzi, I think was older, I believe, but his. He pretty much just um, he did the the typical serial killer. You find you know victims that are easy to prey upon, mm-hmm. and um, that's what he did. And he unfortunately did that, which we'll also see. Like Joel Rifkin did that in the same time frame in New York, on Long Island. Richard Alcala, just uh, just that that area at the seventies was just, and you know New York was just dilapidated. Yeah. in the 70s really bad the number of sex workers was through the roof and the crime was rampant so police didn't really you know they had their hands full i mean the 70s in general was just so bad for serial killers like think about there's so, so many. many back then during like, the 70s it was just insane we could so. do just like one episode it, like dedicated over like different serial killers in the 70s but right it, it's, it's uncanny how much yeah. how much crime not like just within the u.s but everywhere in the world during the 70s i don't know what it was i thought it was supposed to be like the free love yeah, movement, free love you know? no absolutely not it was Oof. it was horrible it was bad horrible time to to be in any type of inner city or just anything honestly it was it was definitely crime was rampant so and you see a lot of serial killers basically coming into their their peak of mm-hmm. killings during the 70s you know ted bundy john wayne gacy zodiac killer zodiac Edmund killer Kemper, and then like, the list can keep going on and on and gary ridgeway i believe was killing in the 70s too yeah. it was just insane so terrible um it, it i think um that about does the richard cottingham saga he's a yeah. he's a sick sadistic fuck put that big gigantic bleep there but that's what he is he's not sorry for shit he's <laughs> the santa claus of your nightmares yes i think we um we definitely covered everything that we have for today so again follow us on every social media platform at killer chills there's a hashtag somewhere in a couple of them but we'll post the links down below yep Follow us on Instagram on our personal accounts, Deb underscore friend underscore, Tim, Tim underscore, underscore friends, Kobiak. <laughs> and follow us at Towergate Studios, too. Yep. Um, all right. Well, that about does it. See you later. See you later.